right now. Uh, have a good session and thank you very much. Thank you. So I would like to very, very warmly welcome uh, today's uh, lectures and participants of our panel and in the name of the University of Arts Belgrade. Uh, my name is Nina Michalinac and I'm the head of the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Policy and Management and uh, cultural diplomacy is only part uh, of, of the program that UNESCO Chair covers, and we are very happy that the university will have this new master program dedicated uh, especially to the topic of cultural diplomacy, uh, which will be uh, the, the topic of today's panel. Yesterday, we discussed very, very interesting issues su such as fair cooperation uh, in, in cultural diplomacy and cultural cooperation. Uh, therefore, I will today present one project that, that deals particularly with the topic of equality, horizontality in, um, and fair practice in cultural diplomacy. Um, we will speak about bottom-up, uh, uh, approaches to cultural diplomacy. So that means that the, at the moment, mm, perhaps the paradigm is shifting uh, and that more and more uh, individual bottom-up actors are uh, um, taking power in decision-making when it comes to this high level actions and activities such as cultural diplomacy. Uh, we will have three lectures today and I will um, present each of yours biography first, then you will have uh, uh, a 10 minutes uh, slot for, for your presentation. I would kindly ask the audience to put questions uh, uh, in the chat while the presenters are, are uh, speaking so that uh, at the end we can have a final discussion and go through the questions and we can all, all engage in, in the discussion. Uh, so um, the first presentation will be given by Professor Louis Bonnet from the University of Barcelona with the topic bottom-up cultural diplomacy, a critical perspective on EU cultural diplomacy um, policies. And um, this topic will be connected to uh, the Creative Europe project he is part of uh, with, a, with the name Stronger Peripheries, a Southern Coalition, which implies, well, the, the activity of a global south in, in, uh, in the global relations. And I'm also very happy that our faculty of dramatic arts is a, a partner in this project. Professor uh, Bonnet, I have to say uh, that as a student, I recalled your name. So I was 22 fundraising for your coming to Belgrade uh, to a conference. Uh, so your, your name uh, and your activities are very well known and promoted in our curricula. Um, pro uh, professor, doc Dr. Louis Bonnet is a professor at the Department of Economics and director of the cultural management program uh, of the University of Barcelona. He has been a research fellow at the MIT and the University of Montpellier and speaker in almost 50 countries, uh, winner of the C CSI Research Prize. And he has been president uh, of the jury of the Cultural Policy Research Award and jury member of many other research prizes, former president of the European Network on Cultural Management and Policy, and cut vice president of the Association uh, of Arts Administration Educators, and Abacus Cooperative and board member of the Association of Cultural Economics International, uh, among other res responsibilities. Uh, he has published books and articles in cultural policies, cultural management and cultural economics, 
and has led uh, or participated in many co competitive research projects, uh, Horizon 2020, and so on and so forth. He, he will be presenting one of these uh, projects uh, uh, that was supported by the Creative Europe program. So Professor Bonnet, please uh, take your take your time. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be today, even though in the distance, not uh, this time in Belgrade. I was uh, some uh, weeks ago uh, in Belgrade, but I can be up and down all the time. So this time will be just online. So I hope the connection will work well and that you can listen to me well. So I will share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see it. Yes? Yes. Perfect. I will try if it works because sometimes it doesn't work a uh, full screen. So now I try the full screen. Uh, okay. Do you see the full screen? Yeah. And I, and I remind the audience to uh, ask questions in the chat or, or, or give comments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I won't be able to read the chat until the end when I will close the oh. screen because it's impossible to see course, <laughs> everything at the same time. Okay, so uh, uh, I prepared uh, uh, a presentation with two sides, with the first part, which was a little bit more theoretical, and the second part, which will be more practical. So the idea is I will, I will just start with some conceptual clarification. That's a very, very short introduction. Later, I will talk a little bit about the EU international cultural relations and diplomacy strategy and the contradictions and the realizations that uh, we can see here. I will talk uh, later about uh, two EU, and as you can see in brackets, funded project. Why in brackets? Because the first one is funded. The second one, we don't know yet. So we presented the proposal, but we don't know yet if we will get the, the money. But it's interesting because one is a Creative Europe uh, project, so part of the European uh, the Creative Europe program. And the second one is a, a part of the Horizon Europe program, so two different EU programs. So that could give me the possibility to, to share with you if it exists or not exists uh, a real clear agenda of international cultural relations and cultural diplomacy at EU level. Uh, so I will- Dear, dear Professor, sorry to intrude, yeah. but uh, the PowerPoint is not full screen. I think there's maybe a problem. So, so you are not looking the second, the, my second screen? No, we're looking at the preparation screen. So, so now, now do you see it? Yeah, now we see the okay, so you see just the my own screen, so with everything, but in any case, I yes, I hope, this will work right yeah, now. Yeah, it works. The only problem is that I, I prepare some animations, and in this presentation mode, we will lose lose the the, the, the animation. Well, but it's not it's not very important. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, as we can see now <laughs> in, the, in the screen. So I will uh, start with this introduction. I will talk a little bit about the EU international cultural relations and, and diplomacy strategy. I will just go to these examples. Uh, one is a Creative Europe uh, program example, struggle peripheries, as has been just said, uh, the Arts University of Belgrade is as well uh, a partner of this, of this uh, project. And the second, it is a proposal. We don't have yet the, the confirmation by the EU uh, about this project, but I think it could be quite interesting to see the differences and, and how from a bottom-up, probably from a citizen uh, approach, we can talk about uh, uh, a different kind of cultural diplomacy. So I do prefer to talk about international cultural relations. And I will just finish my presentation with the final reflection, which is just this question. I think it's synthesized what I want to share at the end. So what is the EU really aiming for in the field of international cultural relations and cultural diplomacy? Because it's not very clear. So I start with my conceptual clarification. So we have three interconnected concepts, cultural diplomacy, new cultural diplomacy, and international, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. 
uh, and international cultural relations. Uh, as you can see, it's quite clear what is cultural diplomacy. I'm using uh, Rafizar definition. Um, he talks about the mobilization of culture to activate soft power. So an essentially interest-driven governmental practice. So cultural diplomacy as uh, Rafizar defines, and I share with him this approach is governmental driven. The new cultural diplomacy has a little bit uh, a different approach because it's a two side and reciprocal cultural diplomacy, which is it's cultural diplomacy, yes, is governmental driven, yes, but we need two sides agreement. It's not just one side which has their own strategy and impose their strategy worldwide, but you need the double approach. And finally, the third concept, international cultural relations, I'm using Higot and Lamonic definition. So, and they said, they tried to foster culture to build a consensus and a common, a common knowledge on the international states based on argumentation. What it means based on argumentation? It means that uh, different stakeholders propose ideas are in the, in, the, in the marketplace, so they are in the agora, and in the agora, all these strategies, all these proposals uh, based on argumentation tries to uh, to build a consensus. So the idea of consensus and common knowledge is in the core of the international cultural relations. Uh, so as you can see, these are three different things. And of course, the question marks, where are we now? What is the situation in Europe? It's very difficult to talk outside Europe. Things are much more complex, but, and the question is, are we going to, towards an organic multi-site system where different practice of international cultural relations coexist with tensions among logics and partners, but aligned to some kind of democratic values like fair collaboration, cultural diversity, dialogue? Are we going to this direction? This is this bottom-up kind of approach that in theory, in the rhetoric of the European Union, we talk about but one thing is the rhetoric, the other thing is the practice. So that is, for me, the concepts that is important to have in mind in order to really understand what we want to talk today. Okay, so, and now I will incorporate in this tension between cultural diplomacy and international cultural relations, I will incorporate who is doing, who are the stakeholders, and what is the role of governments. So in the following, uh, 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 slide, you can see that one thing is cultural diplomacy, top down, mainly one side, aligned under public diplomacy, and in the bottom, bottom up, organic multi site cooperation, not a state driven. But that means that that could be done by the private sector or by the uh, governmental sector. And the private sector, and when I'm talking about private sector, I'm talking not only about the commercial enterprise, I'm talking about the independent sector as well, uh, civil society. <clears throat> government, government could influence them because one thing is to do direct government, uh, direct government intervention. And another thing is an arm length kind of uh, cultural diplomacy or outsourcing, you know, the, uh, just is asking associations, uh, uh, cooperative enterprises to do something that the government is not able to do, but in any way is unsourcing. As you can see, all this left side of the slide in a way is dominated by the government and in the second part is less dominated, but in any case, there is public money. So there is a kind of influence, okay? So that's a private sector. And here you have just different examples. It's different examples. It's a pity that the animation doesn't work, all these numbers that you, you can see, because I wanted to just show <laughs> my slide slowly uh, with different uh, dynamics. So you can see, for instance, the bilateral agreement between two governments uh, on international cultural cooperation, or uh, what an international public TV channel can do. 
or the National Museum exhibition, or what uh, the members of EUNIG, EUNIG, you know, uh, is the network of uh, National Institutes for Culture of the different countries, uh, what they do in the specific uh, facilities in different parts of the world, uh, or the Venice Biennale National Pavilion. These are examples. Uh, and as, as, uh, of course, we can see in the bottom part, and mainly in the right part of the slide, much more uh, private initiative who receive less or more important uh, uh, subsidy by governments. So the influence is lower, uh, but in any case, there is some kind of influence. And is in this right part of the, of the slide, when we see this kind of bottom-up citizen kind of cultural diplomacy, or I would prefer the word international cultural cooperation. Of course, you can see that there is the vertical axis and we have in the top the cultural diplomacy. So when uh, a government is subsidizing the export of books, it's much more governmental driven, huh? which is totally different than when we just give free use of public values that in the, the independent sector can use in order to develop international cultural cooperation with other partners worldwide. So I think this chart is giving us the map the map of the different uh, typologies of, uh, of, uh, of activities. And we can see uh, so in each one of the corners, and of course we could incorporate much more cases in this, in this example. Okay, so going back to the European Union, we know probably it has been, been said before today or yesterday in these conferences, that in, 19, uh, in 2016, uh, after some preliminary phases, the EU decided to include culture in its foreign uh, action, which is new because <coughs> following the, the treaties, this is a subsidiarity kind of policy. The external policy is in the hands of the national governments, not in the hands of the EU. The EU has just a subsidiary. So the word is joint communication, suggesting a blurred line between the cultural diplomacy of the EU member states and the new EU international cultural relations accompanying. And it's important to have this in mind because uh, uh, we are in this logic of subsidiarity. So the EU member states are the responsible for their own cultural diplomacy and international cultural relations, both. And they are the main actors. Well, not the main actors in relation to international cultural relations because the private sector, the independent sector is also very important, but yes, from a political point of view. And what is the role of the EU international cultural relations? It is complementary and is subsidiary. And is based on these three rhetoric arguments. And I underlining the concept rhetoric. Cultural diversity and respect for human rights, a cross-cutting approach to culture, and mutual respect and intercultural dialogue. These are the main three uh, um, outcomes that this kind of policy uh, pres presume to not. And how and not only is complementary and subsidiary, but also is using specific programs, existing programs to conduct them. So there is not a specific program for that, specific fund for that, but the EU is using the Creative Europe program, the Erasmus Plus program, the uh, Horizon Europe program, the, the NDICI, which is the cooperation uh, uh, a strategy for the for the developing countries and others, the regional uh, cross border, other typologies of program, but there is not just a farm for this new policy. And this is important to have in mind because, in a way, that means that the the the, the money is and, and the programs and the projects that we can present uh, in the different. Uh, 
proposals, uh, 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 the different calls, have to at the same time respond to these three main objectives, but also to the logic of each one of the programs. So if we are in the cultural, uh, in the, uh, in the um, uh, Creative Europe program, we have to follow the logic of this specific program, which has been thought only for cooperation among internal EU members. As exactly the same, when we talk about Horizon Europe, Horizon Europe is to support research, uh, cooperation among uh, uh, EU members. But here again, now we are using that for doing things outside Europe for the international cultural relations ago. When we talk about Erasmus Plus, exactly the same. So I'm explaining this because it's in this conjunction of logics that the calls works and the, pro the, the founded projects have to both have sense in this double logic. If we don't understand that, we can understand how the EU can support citizen-based bottom-up kind of projects, okay? So when we talk about the topics, so the focus, so supporting cultural design engine for sustainable social and economic development, as you can see, sustainable social and economic development, social development and economic development, two important topics. Promoting cultural and intercultural dialogue for peaceful intercommunity relations and reinforcing cooperation and cultural heritage. These are the three topics, okay? So that is a little bit the focuses and is in this context that we can understand what we are doing. Okay, so um, uh, as you know, and I will now close one second the presentation because I want to open uh, the, the web. So the, I will just share my screen, that the screen which is, I hope, sorry, because sometimes I don't know why, and I have so many things open. Uh, oh my God, uh, I don't know now how to share the, okay, this one. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, this is the stronger peripheries. Uh, okay, perfect, do you see? Yes. Right. So now this is the, the, the web page of the stronger peripheries. This is, this Creative Europe uh, project uh, funded by the Creative Europe program. And as you can see here in the webpage, and I like it to show the webpage and not prepare a specific slide for you because it's the way that to introduce you to all the resources that you could find later in this webpage. So Stronger Peripheries is a project of the Southern Coalition, a space for dialogue, collaboration, and joint learning to question and discuss the notion of South and periphery uh, through diverse collaborative artistic strategies. Okay, so I think it's important to understand that. So this is clearly at bottom up. So if we analyze this project founded by the EU, we could see and we can say that the EU is promoting these kind of values. Of course, the question is, is only promoting this kind of project or is promoting as well other kind of projects? Okay, you can see, of course, many different kind of projects, but this is a very clear case. So of course, uh, uh, we can go to the Southern Coalition and to try to see who are these people? Who is the Southern uh, uh, Coalition? And we can, of course, we go here and know more about this. So here you can uh, find what is the concept that we are using for about South, about peripheries, uh, what is the, the network, what uh, 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 the, uh, uh, well, there are here, and here uh, I'm just looking in this, the Serbian, the Serbian uh, version. So you can now have here the explanation uh, in the different languages of the project. And this is as well something we wanted to show. So as you can see, I started with Catalan. So here you have the Catalan, but you have as well uh, in the different languages. Uh, I don't know what is happening here. So some of the uh, 
uh, so was of Hungarian or Italian or Portuguese. Of, uh, so in a way we are showing through the use of our different languages, why is the values of our project? And I think that is quite interesting. Of course, of course, you can go to the events and activities and you can see uh, the, the, the meetings the seminars that we are doing and as well, if you go to the, the, the calls, so we are just uh, sending calls to artists, we work with co-productions, so there are a lot of information that you could find here and then the, the, the new tandems uh, that we are organizing among us in order to develop the project. So I'm, now, I'm going quite fast because time is going on, but what I want you is to take your time uh, to see the, the, what the project is proposing. Here you can see the artist portfolio that we are working with. with. You can see as well the, the media gallery of activities we uh, organize until now. And of course, you can see so workshops on audience analysis, uh, the toolkit of implementation, tandem connections, uh, the seminar towards fair international cultural cooperation, vision from the peripheries that we organized last January in Barcelona. So you can see many of our activities. So this is a very clear case of, uh, of, a, of a project that, uh, that uh, <coughs> really uh, is bottom up, uh, who tries to build things, who is, is, is online with these three main aims of the international, of the EU intercultural uh, relations strategy. So later, maybe we can just go farther in during the uh, questions and answers, but time is going up. So I have to, to try to, to go farther. So the other project, and I will be very, very short because, uh, sorry, because I need to go again to the, okay. This is, this is the presentation. So these are so these are the other project is uh, Protein. Protein is, I hope, will be founded by the Horizon uh, Europe. So uh, this is a cultural. Uh, sorry, it is, a, it is a research program of the European Union. And what is about is public-private partnership in the international cultural relations, which in a way the objective connects with the objective of the call. So we need to propose something from the bottom, but it's what is connected to what in the call is asking. So it's always when you present a proposal to be founded to the European Union, we need to, to find, the, we, to, to merge what the call is asking you and what is your own interest and try to see the, 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 the aspects that uh, are in common in order to propose something which have a real possibility to win. Uh, uh, for instance, in our case, we are competing with 57 other projects, 57 other projects, and we know that the EU only will found, only will finance three of these 57 projects. Of course, what the evaluators will do is try to see not only of the quality of the project, not only on the technicalities, if the budget is well done, et cetera, et cetera, all these technicalities that are uh, evaluated in order to have the best points, but also if the project fits the call proposals. So that's why it's so important. And it's in this case that you see that um, uh, there is a governmental driven approach because who brought the call uh, requirements and aims are the civil servants, the, the people, the policy makers. So in this way, even though we could do something absolutely independent, uh, it's clear that we need to, 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 to merge with the call proposals. So after this, Two examples, I'm really sorry because I didn't have time to develop them a lot, but uh, we have other people in the round table who uh, won't be very happy if I'm talking too much. So uh, what is the current situation? Well, the, cur the current situation, and I'm using a couple of researchers' points of view, 
is that uh, inside the European Union, there is tension between the different external action services and delegations. So the political section is focusing on cultural for political dialogue with third countries and stakeholders. The press and information section wants culture for strategic communication of the EU, and the cooperation section wants culture for development. So we see tensions uh, among this, the agreement of these main goals. But finally, specific, uh, specific um, civil servants in the external action service and delegations, each one is pushing in relation to their own agenda. A second issue that my father Damaso uh, in uh, her report uh, underlines is the long-term policy goal. So uh, from persuasion or attraction towards a strengthening civil society from the bottom up. So that is the long-term policy goal, the rhetoric one. But we also see a more geostrategically dualized world where uh, unilateralism dominates. A strong relationship with civil society in other countries can be sent from ECR bottom up. But at the same time, the idea of supporting liberal values in the long run, contributing to geopolitical resilience. And this is very important to have this in mind in a moment. And I think the Ukrainian war is in a way showing very mm -hmm. clear how the previous global uh, uh, process has been substituted for a more regional geostrategical uh, approach. In this way, in this process, what will be the role of international cultural relations founded by the EU? So and that's why I'm using Higgins and LaMonica uh, bill. So the world, they say, and they said this before, the starting of the Ukrainian war, the world is not multipolar, nor it is tightly bipolar. And uh, in, when they wrote that, they talked about USA and China, but this is as well an era of growing populist uh, nationalism. And in this approach, the EU ECR is dysfunctional. Now it is dysfunctional because the paradigm is, it was built, built in 2016 and later, uh, yeah, it's changing. So we will see if there is or not a clash between EU ECR narrative, the ambiguity, uh, the role of the, uh, the each uh, country. And as I told you before, uh, each one of the uh, national uh, governments are the ones who define their own cultural diplomacy and international cultural western strategy. So, but, but at the same time, we see in crisis of the budget because creative Europe and neighborhood uh, policies as well, development international cultural instruments uh, uh, are now have a better pro budget now than in the previous six years. So of course that could change uh, over the next uh, priorities, but that is the reality. So, we are in a very strange moment of, uh, which is very difficult to really see what will happen. So I, final, I, I finalize with some final questions and dilemmas, which as you can see are question marks, or just questions, I don't have an answer. But of course we could spend a lot of time debating on each one of these questions. So, what role do different cultural stakeholders play, both the public sector and the private sector uh, in relation to the ECR resources, in programming decisions, in lobbying activities and so on. Uh, we also can ask if, is there a greater autonomy of cultural institutions? So less state driven cultural diplomacy uh, are these conditions to for fair international cultural relations, protection of cultural diversity, and promotion of equitable cultural dialogue? Are we in this in this position or not? Or would it be more difficult in the event of a predominance of a more rigid state-driven cultural diplomacy? Maybe that is the next feature. We don't know yet. Or will the bilateral relations better secure the opportunities of countries with fewer resources? Because of course, in the EU, there are not. All, not all the countries have the, 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 the same level of power. So uh, if we want to develop a specific 
policy is bilateral relations better than this multilateral approach that the EU is framing. So, of course, we can discuss at the EU level more specifically uh, what is the role of the different uh, countries, uh, uh, what, is, what are the role of the most influential countries, German and French foreign ministries, or the European Cultural Networks, or EUNIC, or the professionals. Uh, again, the problem with the Ukrainian crisis and the tightening of international relations. So what is the role for cultural, international cultural relations in this new context? Uh, and finally, what can we do for standing for collaboration, diversity, and dialogue? So I finish here. I'm sorry for being so fast in my last comments, but I know that time was just uh, very short. So uh, thank, you. thank you, Professor. You touched my heart and soul um, as a person working. Uh, in the Creative Europe program and uh, advising uh, uh, cultural operators to apply, we always have numerous, numerous questions in, in the practical sense, all, all of those that you mentioned. And we're having internal emotional conflicts and ethical conflict, conflicts all the time. Um, so now we're going to um, hear the second presentation uh, of the two colleagues from Italia, uh, Vittoria Lombardi and Stefania Magnano, um, with the title A Culture and Projects, Communities as Agent of Cultural Diplomacy, uh, Diplomatic Processes, the Role of Participatory Cultural Projects and Practices, um, this is again the question of bottom-up uh, approaches and shaping cultural cooperation. Uh, please let me uh, read the biography of uh, Stefania Magnano, who will be uh, presenting. Uh, she is, uh, sorry, it will be uh, Vittoria. Yeah, there will be only me to the- uh, Okay, to okay. Uh, so, Vittoria is a curator and director of cultural projects, gra graduated in international studies for development and co cooperation, and since 2012 she has been working as a creative producer and project manager in the cultural sector, nourishing her interests along the line of intersection between artistic practices and social research, particularly site-specific participatory and community-based projects on a national and international level. She recently specialized in social impact assessment and welfare community management at the University of Turin and Bologna, cultural leadership, cultural diplomacy, and results-based management, embedding those approaches and tools in her curating daily uh, practices. She believes and sustains performance as a tool for promoting and fostering social inclusion, community empowerment, and political consciousness. And since 2002, she has been working as a project designer, welfare community manager, and audience engagement expert at the social ent enterprise as Nudi SR all over, if I uh, uh, read it correctly. Um, the years she, she took part in several cultural exchange, uh, exchanges sustained by Boarding Pass Plus program, uh, encountering artists and communities from Southeast Asia and late Latin American countries. So, Vittoria, the, flo the floor is yours. And uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for inviting us uh, to take part in this uh, in this conference. Uh, so I, I, I um, uh, our speech is uh, strongly related also to what was stated by Professor Louis Bonnet before, um, and we title we name our our speech communities uh, uh, as agents of cultural diplomatic processes uh, the role of participatory cultural projects and practices. Because over the years, uh, we have 
observed how international cultural projects and intercultural exchanges have a specific role in uh, fostering mutual comprehension at in uh, at intercultural level, uh, reaching goals of intercultural solidarities that are at the core center of cultural and diplomatic actions. So Culturing Projects has been dealing for years in uh, curatorship and productive development for the performing arts with uh, a specific attention to site-specific projects uh, based on the involvement and active participation of communities. So we, we have been working from an international pers perspective, believing that making things uh, together, interweaving artists, institutions and local communities from different contexts and cultural backgrounds uh, is a fundamental step toward a bottom-up cultural cooperation and um, uh, cultural cooperation strategies. But, but the question that uh, um, uh, that arise in, uh, in our practices is which role do we have as artists, producers and, uh, and, and cultural mediators in these processes and how does the role of an artistic production of a festival and the theater program, for instance, or a cultural projects uh, that acts as windows as well to other cultural contexts uh, by making international co-production possible or presenting works from different cultural backgrounds differ from the role of cultural diplomatic institutions. So how could we find innovative ways for collaboration that recognize uh, the broader role of the cultural sector in democratizing intercultural relations in a, in a more people-centered way that involve communities as agents of cultural and diplomatic processes. So we, we believe and we stated that bottom-up cross-cultural collaboration between artists and cultural professionals can leverage multiple opportunities as well for traditional diplomatic institutions to redesign contemporary strategies of cultural cooperation, letting new languages and particip participatory practices to cross over. So cultural diplomacy uh, as a political science born and developed in a specific historical moment that was linked to the idea of exporting cultural values to maintain a specific geopolitical hegemony and a specific territorial balance through, uh, well, often linked to cultural colonialism. So the idea of cultural supremacies and that the Western world had something to teach was uh, sometimes an explicit, sometimes a more subtle belief for a, while, for a long time. But nowadays the need of, for a cultural diplomacy that is conscious of the necessary, the constructive and the colonizing processes that, uh, that lies in how we approach culture, intercultural relations is something very urgent. So globalization and digi digitalizations uh, have progressively downsized, if not reduced, um, sometimes the role of traditional cultural institutions. And we can have already observe a different and prominence of civil societies organizations in promoting cultural diplomacies and in being the new protagonist of a different approach. Um, and, and we believe that through the support of uh, those practices made by as well for, by, by the cultural uh, civil society organization, also the more traditional cultural institution can regenerate themselves. Um, we observe that direct funding for culture, for example, through the European funding program has led a great number of private individuals to become promoters themselves of processes sometimes consciously, sometimes uh, more unconsciously of cultural cooperation. And this funding and support are a downward distribution of that diplomatic power that, uh, that institution used to have and still have. And we believe that this uh, distribution of diplomatic power is something, is something good that can bring, bring some uh, interesting transformation. Of course, a lot is still to, to be done. And first of all, investing in, equal, uh, in the equality of artistic mobility from artists and cultural professionals from different parts of the world 
or otherwise this downward distribution of diplomatic power doesn't really achieve the necessary goal and that and standard standards of decolonization that we think are required. Uh, but what is the type of cultural cooperation that arises from uh, bottom-up processes and how, why do we stress the role of participatory techniques, techniques in that? So participatory and site-specific projects uh, are always uh, strictly related to the context and depend and rely on the context. It is, in fact, the context that dictates the role, the, the rules and development of a project, and the context cannot be ignored. So this is a primarily uh, and the destructive element um, because it shifts completely the role of the artist and the cultural worker facilitators to a second, to a second, a second plane, to a second level. It is, an, it is uh, uh, yet an engine of the, uh, for the development of the creative process, but it, it remains in the background. So the agency of the, uh, of the participating community that brings its own experience and subjectivity into the process is the very protagonist. So participatory practices make local communities equal actors within the creative projects. So this, the exchange is mutual and not one way. So each person is a local, has the possibility to become a local ambassador and the space for negotiation between is actually created in a more equal way. The second aspects that we think um, that we think characterize participatory projects and, and make and make them um, a, a trigger for cultural diplomacy is, uh, is the, the, the need for long-term permanence in a place that, that, that brings the um, that brings the artists and the cultural professional to deepen the local context. So we don't and 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 to learn actually uh, how the, the local context uh, um, is, 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 is working and functioning. So in fact, in, in, in a conference that was, was held in Milan at the end of 2019, uh, that was uh, about the interna internationalization of the Italian art scene, it was actually discussed that the value of internationalization is actually what we do we take home as lessons learned rather than what, what, rather than what we expert in terms of competencies. And, and in fact, one of the questions is actually what kind of impacts can you can can lessons learned from abroad can generate in, in your local context. At the same time, there are other examples that we think uh, about bottom up uh, processes and bottom up local projects that uh, foster cultural diplomacy. Uh, there, there, uh, there is an increasing an increasing number of local cultural projects that deal with diaspora communities. For example, in, uh, in Milano, Milano Mediterranea, which is a post-colonial participatory art center that speaks the languages of me the Mediterranean, uh, aims to involve citizens through, through a participatory art residency and a permanent workshop that is aimed mostly at young people, and it, uh, it, it, it address the diaspora communities of the Mediterranean that are, uh, that are uh, um, often invisibilized in the cultural processes to, 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 to shape link uh, between different cultures. Um, at the same time, uh, the circulation of uh, theater projects that address uh, topics uh, related to inter in intercultural um, intercultural relations uh, could foster uh, cultural diplomacies, and this is, for instance, the example of an Italian artistic company that we work with, uh, which is named Corp Citoyen, uh, which is an Italian Tunisian company that is uh, shaping a, a theatrical trilogy about the perception of the others, and. Um, so we 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 started with um, 
with the performance that was addressing the perception of the, the orientalistic perception uh, of the other, um, starting from the, 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 the quintessential form of representation, and uh, which is the scenic fiction, and bringing these, uh, bringing, bringing this, this show in different contexts um, actually opens, uh, uh, opens a, a huge debate uh, among different um, in different communities about what is uh, the meaning of being represented um, the identity representation of the other that is uh, is always uh, is always a link um, so with something that happened within inter intercultural and connection um, so I will I, I will close uh, with um, Quoting, um, quoting a, a part of um, quoting a, a book that is um, that is named "Communities of Imagination: Contemporary Southeast Asia," to to bring the last example of how culture, how bottom up um, and cultural bottom up processes and cultural projects can foster uh, cultural diplomacy, uh, which is actually how the aesthetic syncretism that is uh, is brought into cultural cultural projects is also a way to deconstruct dominant cultural symbols and 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 reshape new links between uh, between culture uh, the book communities of imagination written by Ka catherine diamond uh, is uh, published by the university of a white press and analyzed the new trends mm -hmm. in south East Asia um, generations, uh, artistic generation. In Southeast Asia, modernity is largely imposed by European administration with regard for indigenous systems. When foreign and theater became identified with modern, indigenous theater became traditional, each defining contrast to the, to the other. The new theatrical styles, content, and stage technologies introduced by 19th century European colonizations affected the indigenous theater in three basic ways. Traditional theaters attempted to incorporate trends in foreign aesthetics and stage technology, even when they went against their own characteristic. Hybrid theaters arose in new colonial centers that adapted to foreign narratives and included the popular song and dances on the, of the day that were themselves hybrid creation. And the development of a new genre, serious spoken drama, was used to address current social and political issues. But multi-level consciousness has become to the new world view, particularly of those living in the in rapidly growing metropolis. Since the most contemporary theater practitioners comes from this group, um, so, sorry, one common trait among the, the regions of the B and trilingual middle classes is their ability to express themselves in English. Since most contemporary theater practitioners come from this group, the theater itself possesses a cosmopolitan urbanity that simultaneously and self-consciously explodes, explodes and distinguishes its local roots. Southeast Asian contemporary theatres often employ the same techniques as Western experimental theatres, but their narratives reflect local manifestations of global impact, both to distinguish them artistically on international stages and to appeal more intimately to local audience. So they demonstrate an awareness about how they stand in relation to not only other types of live local performance, but also the mass media, foreign theater trends, and the neighborhood standard of and the neighbor, uh, and the neighborhood standards of being the world class. So it's actually this um, this exercise is, is a stresses how the uh, aesthetic hybridation, uh, the aesthetic syncretism, is also a very interesting a very interesting element. Uh, through which observe how we uh, how we could deconstruct dominant cultural symbols and and build new way of uh, in international and cultural encounters. So, um, 
we 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 read uh, some some times ago uh, a provocative paper uh, that was uh, written by by uh, Nan Van Hote, the former secretary of IETM, the International Network for Performing Arts, uh, that was named "Should Our Funds for the Arts Pay for Cultural Democracy?" So we should say that actually, fund for the arts should pay for the arts, as art can be a very powerful device for cultural democracy in itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. OK, because we have a lot of uh, questions and, and interesting um, uh, issues to discuss, let's just uh, switch to, to the third presentation. Uh, by, which will be given by Pandago Fronte, Fronterzio, a cultural uh, a, a worker uh, um, who works on the Mexico-U.S. border. Um, and Paola Ellen Niento Parades from the Sibelius Academy, board, with the title of the presentation, uh, Border Diplomacies, Other Diplomacies. The case of Pandagio uh, cultural, cultural event in Mexico, Mexico border. Uh, Paola is a cultural manager from the Mexico City and based in Helsinki. She is experienced on artist, artist management and event production in the fields of music and performing arts. She has worked for several organizations and artists in Finland and Mexico such as Compania Cari and Ronnie Martin, uh, April Jazz Festival, and so on. She holds an MA in Arts Management, Society and Creative Entrepreneurship by the Sibelius Academy, University of Arts Helsinki, with a secondary subject and research focus on management of global cultural expressions and uh, diplomacy. Uh, therefore, Paola has interest in developing art projects that promote intercultural dialogue and mutual understanding between societies. And she also holds a specialization in cultural policies by Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana uh, and a BA in cultural studies and cultural management by Universidad de, del Claustro de Sor Juana. <laughs> Even though we, we watched a lot of uh, 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 Latin American so, soap operas, our Spanish is not that good <laughs> still. So Paula, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello everyone and thanks uh, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, yeah, and also, well, I would like to say that I feel very honored to be participating in the conference and to share this session with you. I am also very happy to bring some perspectives from a case of the Global South that responds to an urgent need of informing non-state cultural diplomacy from this world order. Okay, so in 2016, the United States of America experienced one of its most controversial presidential campaigns that gather extensive coverage by the international media. Donald Trump, who was running for president of the US and one of his most widely reported proposals were about issues of immigration and border security. Not only did he propose the reinforcement of an immigration policy that for long has been characterized as harsh, but he threatened uh, to build a wall on the Mexico-US border after making public a discourse that um, stereotype the many illegal Mexican immigrants as criminals, drug dealers and rapists. Retaking yesterday's conversation on the researchers' locus of initiation 
I may say that I identify myself, myself as migrant and Mexican. And have had family members that illegally cross the border in pursuit of the so-called American dream. So you can guess how shocking this discourse was to me, as well as to the many immigrants and inhabitants of the borderlands who were promised by this campaign with even more material, legal and psychological harshness. And I say even more because the security enforcement of the border started already in the 20th century, therefore revealing a complex binational relationship marked by multiple crossings, permissions and prohibitions. Indeed, according to the author Oliveras Gonzalez, there are two opposed yet interweave connotations in the, in the understanding and identity of the Mexico-US border region. First uh, is this hybrid and transborder character full of connections and flows that simultaneously coexist with the connotation of separation where contrasts, inequality and power asymmetries are reaffirmed. In other words, it is an asymmetric nation between two nations. I'm not going to dig into the very interesting political and social cultural dynamics of this area, but on screen you can see how the borderline and the borderland, in this case between Tijuana in Mexico and San Diego in the, in the US, physically look like. Within this context, Fandango Fronterizo, the case that I am presenting today, finds its existence. Fandango Fronterizo is a Mexican folk music event that since 2008 gathers the Jaranero as well as other local and migrant communities of the border territories. With the Jaranero community, I refer to those who participate in a Mexican tradition called Fandango originated in the colonial period of this region and described as a communal social festive universe where music, dance, poetry and food are essential elements. In other words, Fandango Fronterizo is taking and adapting a living tradition to a new territory and context such as the border. What makes it even more special is its binational component, as it is held exactly at the fence that divides the cities of Tijuana and San Diego. Therefore, the attendants at both sides interact, dance, play music together, despite the physical separation. Ironically, resignifying the, resignifying the wall as a sacred meeting point, where even though people are barely allowed to touch except for the fingertips, migration documents are not required. Uh, by analyzing the key narratives, images, values, social cultural outcomes and other elements produced by Fandango Fronterizo and the means in which this impact the local and migrant communities in the border, it is possible to state that Fandango Fronterizo is an example of non-state and bottom-up form of cultural diplomacy in the following ways. First, uh, even though Fandango Fronterizo is not present as a political event, but as a cultural event or a tradition, it holds by iso facto a political connotation regarding borders and migration. Fandango Fronterizo's public communications and research data coincide that it is a protest, a manifestation, to visualize and to bring down symbolically the borders. Nevertheless, it is as well an encounter that unites diverse people, that creates empathy for other people through a cultural expression that is Fandango. In this, ways, in this way, the case performs and embodies narratives that contest the physical and psychological harshness of, of borders, which in turn are the result of power exception in asymmetrical north-south relations. Particularly speaking, these narratives counteract the na negative perce perceptions of marginalized border territories like Tijuana, by representing it in all its complexities. Uh, 
and in more general terms, it engages on an issue of global concert, which is migration. Therefore, appealing to other territories and experiences outside the Mexico-US framework, where physical or ideological borders exist as well. For, is, for instance, it has inspired people in other 20 cities in Mexico, US, Canada, Spain, France and Switzerland to replay, replicate the same idea, but departing from their own local experiences and realities in this issue. Here in the, in the presentation, you can see images of the Fandango in Basel, Switzerland, outside the premises of a federal asylum center where they are playing for the migrants who are placed in confined spaces. And next to it is a map of this network that creates a rather horizontal relation to their other counterparts in the world and beyond the structures of a nation state relation. Uh, so, well, the first two bullet points I have talked already about that. But then uh, there's the social cultural impact that Fandango Fronterizo generates in the border. Uh, it's translated in terms of creating heterogeneous communities in supporting the identity reinforcement of the participants and in building safe spaces for intercultural dialogues in a migratory context hit by political harshness, violence and other unfolded naturalizations of inequality. The means in which Fandango Fronterizo articulate these spaces are dialogue, long-term and participatory projects, engagement, value promotion, cooperation, collaboration, co-creation and exchanges beyond the national interest. Means that parallel, of course, to newer critical approaches of cultural diplomacy and which are favored as well to showcases, self-promotion and image projection promoted by the traditional Western state-centric model of cultural diplomacy. Yeah. Despite the parallelism to newer critical approaches, it is important to state that Fandango Fronterizo's practices and diplomatic role are built in their own terms, which are rather positioned in the global South, East, Third World metaphorical world order. Besides from the geopolitical position of Fandango Fronterizo and its engagement with immigration and other experiences of systemic oppression and discrimination, the organizational system that Fandango Fronterizo employs is based on values and principles of a non-Western tradition, the Fandango which prioritizes collective subjects and interests and where relations and exchanges are particularly driven by traditional and communi communal societal values such as reciprocity, participatory dynamics, mutual acknowledgement and horizontality. Also, it has a volunteer and collective based economy, in this case detached from the state support, for example. These values are intended to be preserved as much as the context allows, although negotiations are constantly done in order to deal with the features of the modern world in which we are inserted, as well as the restrictions of the border space. Given said this, Fandango Fronterizo's example suggests that the borderlands, both physically and metaphorically, enact a territory for other forms of cultural diplomacies or other forms of bottom-up cultural diplomacies as well. Moreover, it partakes in building border diplomacy and other counter-hegemonic proposal of cultural diplomacy conceived in terms of Mignolo and Dostanova's border thinking theory, which I can explain briefly. Border thinking is a method of the colonial thinking and doing that departs from the exteriority as a place of enunciation. In other words, in, it integrates the possibility to speak from the margins of different social structures and asymmetries, including the borderlands. 
Moreover, it is a conceptualization of the experience of physically living in the border, where contradicting elements need to be dealt and negotiated, not rejected, but subsumed or redefined. Just like Fandango Fronterizo is doing, it is therefore a reflexive process at the conjun conjunction between Western and non-Western thinking, and that includes a double criticism regarding both traditions of thought. So building on this theory, border diplomacy could be as well a proposal framed in the intersection of borders and from the experience of living in the border that does not find its center in the action of the state, that it is built by alternative values from a tradition, that it is implemented by non-Western communal and festive forms of organization, and that it is formed in relation to marginalized positions that migrants or communities uh, separated by that border experience. Uh, finally, I just close by saying that although some of the exposed principles co coincide with other forms of non-state cultural diplomacy from the North, such as cosmopolitan diplomacy, citizen di diplomacy, this proposal contributes to acknowledge non-Western values and practices that have been displaced by a Western domination of concepts, frameworks and cases. Moreover, it proves that the traditional Western and state-centered model of diplomacy, of cultural diplomacy and its universality is also being questioned from the global so south and also the border. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, and finally, there is my presentation um, that that okay uh, that should present the project that we are um, involved in as a University of Arts Belgrade and UNESCO Chair in Cultural Policy and which is uh, developed from the need to continue our cooperation with the University of Lyon uh, too, um, which, which, was, which lasted for 20 years now. And it's unfortunately in question precisely due to um, financial issues and the question of pro profitability. Uh, so our project really uh, is important for continuation of the cooperation, but also it gives us space to ask questions about the future of uh, not only cultural cooperation, but academic cooperation. Uh, luckily, the Creative Europe program uh, will uh, put in focus education and in future uh, Erasmus and Creative Europe will be uh, more uh, uh, interconnected. Um, so I, I really see uh, this project uh, as a stepping stone, as a, as a milestone, as a good opportunity for, for us to rethink all the questions that were raised during even this panel. Uh, so the name, the, uh, the title of the project is Shaking, uh, Sharing Subaltern Knowledge in Cultural Cooperation. Um, we started uh, with a doubt and a, and a need to rethink cultural management as a scientific uh, uh, and, uh, and academic field which was developed in the context of neoliberal uh, systems where cultural pr practitioners, cultural professionals should uh, develop cultural products and um, develop the cultural market and the creative sectors, which are all uh, uh, main goals of the, the EU programs so uh, and UNESCO programs and so on. So international agents are promoting entrepreneurship, um, competitiveness of cultural sectors. As Professor um, 
Bonnet would, was uh, uh, saying uh, uh, at the beginning. But we uh, as uh, uh, cultural professionals are facing th these ethical issues, uh, being that numerous uh, imbalances uh, among territories and individuals and organizations are taking place. Yesterday, we were speaking uh, in this conference on, uh, uh, of the question of fair rem remuneration in EU projects where you have uh, uh, UK, UK uh, experts being paid 300 per, per hour, and for example, Macedonian administrators of the projects that are paid 30 euros per, per hour. Um, so we wanted to, to uh, uh, question all, all these practices of international cooperation um, with, with the point of view of um, alternative approaches. So we used the key, key notion, uh, subalternity, subaltern, subal, subaltern, subaltern identity and subaltern knowledge. Um, and we had a lot of debates on uh, what subaltern knowledge in cultural policy and management means. And therefore we organized within the project um, uh, a program of learning sessions and lectures with different international experts that deal with these questions. And for example, we, we had lectures on participatory feminist economy uh, or uh, uh, the topic of constructing pluriverse plur, plur, plur or the topic of horizontal uh, decision-making. Um, international projects in culture and international cooperation is really facing no, numerous challenges, uh, both cultural, when, when you uh, connect different cultural actors, those coming from global south, global north, uh, uh, economic issues are always present. Um, even in, in the, in the, the process of organizing the project. You, uh, for example, the uh, French university has a group of administrators who are well paid to administer the project. And the University of Arts is really struggling because of the low, uh, low uh, incomes of people working in the uh, administrative uh, departments and so forth and so and so forth. So um, the project gathers three universities, University of Arts Belgrade and uh, University Lyon II um, and our fields of research are cultural policy and management. Then there is uh, Bauhaus University of Weimar with uh, students who are more uh, uh, um, professionalizing in the field of arts and media studies uh, uh, and, art, uh, and artistic uh, activity. And we also have two civil society organizations, uh, independent cultural scene of Serbia as an umbrella of organization of civil society organizations here in Serbia and a Stockholm Museum of Women History who should bring a feminist perspective. And when, when I say feminist perspective, it, it is still not clear what feminist means because feminism has different, uh, 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 def it can be defined in different theoretical context contexts. So therefore um, uh, we um, decided to uh, form a platform where our students will be able to uh, uh, meet and conduct international projects together, mentored by people who are part of the consortium, both practitioners and academics. Uh, we formed groups 
and uh, organized uh, mentoring sessions with students who were developing projects. They were uh, also supported by uh, invited and guest experts with their lectures on the topic of subalternity. And we are, we are also, uh, for the sake of sustainability, developing a platform, an online platform that will be, uh, uh, that will serve as a space where all, all these people who meet within the project and all our alumni will be uh, um, able to, to continue then work, their work and continue to be supported by, by uh, our institutions. Um, so the process started, uh, we finished the first year and did an evaluation. And I will try to point uh, to certain uh, 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 conclusions that we, and certain issues that we faced and discussed after uh, the evaluation. Uh, what, one question was, are we uh, actually being, uh, by giving this opportunity for horizontal learning, uh, shared leadership, uh, working with the topics that are completely alternative to what's going on in real life, uh, are, are we being uh, irresponsible towards our students? We didn't give them that much knowledge in project management, um, uh, budget, uh, um, budget management, financial management, fundraising, uh, audience development. So we didn't give them all those skills that are in core of cultural management that much. We didn't have time. So the focus was on new new ways of organizing, new ways of thinking, and new topics that they're that are not that much present in uh, cultural management curricula. So finally, after the first year, we're not sure if they, they will be ready to, to um, step up on the market and to fundraise and, and do, do the work that, that is um, necessary. So that was one issue uh, that, that, was, that was raised. The second issue uh, that I was particularly uh, uh, affected by was the, the grading process. So all the time we were talking about uh, horizontality and uh, um, shared decision-making, but at, at the end, uh, we, the professors and the mentors were the one giving grades. And uh, there wasn't a clear system and that, that is also the question of, of evaluation of the project, uh, which is why some students got uh, lower grades, some weren't that satisfied, and so on and so forth. So this, the, 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 we, we, uh, con we concluded that we should find a new, a better mechanism for grading the students. And even we proposed uh, some some new alternative models such as uh, uh, giving the students opportunity not to be grades or to give the grades uh, them to themselves to self evaluate within the group. So these are new questions that really can reform uh, university curricula, and th this is why the project is really exciting and can be uh, a transform, can transform um, our approaches to, to academic teaching and learning. Um, we also faced the, the question of promoting the identity politics. Majority of student projects uh, dealt with a certain identity group, uh, whether it would it be artists or an LGBT community or elderly uh, people. Uh, uh, 
and they were developing their their uh, um, pro projects primarily uh, uh, with an idea to help help those uh, vulnerable vulnerable groups or marginalized groups and majority of them uh, worked on the topic of artists. So certain mentors and certain professors were criticizing this particular uh, issue by saying that artists are not the most endangered uh, uh, groups of people in today's society. And that uh, the students seen themselves as those who are part of the subaltern groups. And this is also the, the question of having a privileged, uh, a privileged uh, uh, position within, within, uh, within a project, within a, a society. Um, so we will make some changes in the second year. Uh, we decided to have actually to have a more firm uh, uh, schedule, more firm um, division of responsibilities. Uh, and from, from this um, laissez faire uh, attitude, now we are, we are uh, the, in the second phase, we are uh, uh, aiming to make a clearer structure that will, will finally support the ideas of the project. And mm, this is one of the most important things th uh, that we conducted, that we concluded. Uh, so self-organization should be learned from the start. So how to self-organize, how to be, uh, how to work in the horizontal manner. That is something that should be um, decided first and luckily there are a lot of uh, um, literature and knowledge and experiments uh, on the topic of self-management also in latin america also in spain um, and we believe that all these knowledge should enter more more the decisively in in the corpus of uh, knowledge shared within cultural management structures, whether uh, it's uh, universities or uh, networks such as NCAT. So the project hasn't finished yet. We have uh, time to develop it and uh, I, I will be happy to share um, all the future, future results and experience that we gain. And um, by this, I will conclude or even ask um, professors who are now present and part of the project, if they want to add some, uh, some of their experiences within. Uh, if not, we can proceed to the discussion part uh, because there are a lot of uh, questions raised during the the lectures. If you agree, we can do that. So I will start with the first one. Uh, and I will read it. Uh, there was a question of the possibility to create a new non-aligned movement in culture, uh, especially in the context in war in Ukraine. And Professor uh, uh, Milan Andragicevic Shashic added uh, that not only the war in Ukraine, but the wars in Africa and Asia should be more uh, stimulative to reconsider a new non aligned movement as war uh, against Ukraine forced Ukraine to join NATO. Uh, uh, and this is very, uh, this question is very interesting for, for Serbia, wh where this conference take, take, takes place. Uh, because Serbia and even Yugoslavia was invited to take part in the NATO in, uh, in 60s 
And now again, um, and the government refused. Tito decided to create no, no, to 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 not to, not to create, but to take part in the non-aligned movement. And our current president is still um, balancing be between uh, EU, China, Russia uh, uh, forces. So we are in this this position um, of being non-aligned. So, Professor, the question was for you. <laughs> no, no, I'm just uh, thinking that, in fact, we are not non-aligned. We are multiple aligned, and that's a problem. And uh, unfortunately, yeah. mm -hmm. I do not see the forces. Narendra Modi in India, he forgot about it. New Egyptian government as military government. So unfortunately, I don't see old forces being really present and uh, wanting to reestablish non-aligned movement. And specifically war in Ukraine has shown that uh, those countries that has been had leadership in this uh, movement are today countries that do not have their politics, they are following, they are, uh, or they're ignoring problems and focusing on their own problems, not really showing solidarity, for example, with with Yemen. Yemen used to be one of the country that founded non-aligned movement, Iraq and so on. So Sri Lanka, which now is in terrible yeah. problems. No one yeah, but is. the question is what India and, uh, and Pakistan will do. They, they re refused to give support to uh, the United States. But they are refusing to to align on one side. It's right, yeah. still not active policy of non alignment That's right. Uh, this is now the question uh, of the possibility of future actions. No, I, uh, I would see we need a completely new forces. New, new I don't see political forces. In cultural field, I even see even less legacy. Tomorrow I will speak in my speech about legacy, cultural legacy of non-aligned movement. And uh, I think that new idea should be created, not built on the legacy of that, which is very small, but to be created from zero with the new progressive forces in the world. Unfortunately, voices of people like Orban and others, Erdogan are much more are stronger than any voice of the, let's say pacifist uh, movement. So I'm in this moment, I'm extremely yes, skeptical. Yes, skeptical. I'm just, uh, I, um, I support and I contribute to your idea that we have to at least uh, historically rethink legacies and the importance of the movement because otherwise it's in total oblivion. My students of the Western countries, they even never heard for the notion yeah. not to speak about activism. Okay, thank you. Professor Bonnet. Okay, <clears throat> I will try to answer from my point of view the question. First of all, the non-alignment movement was a political movement and it's important to, to, to have this in mind uh, in a very specific moment of the Cold War. Uh, and we work here and the topic of the conference is the cultural diplomacy and uh, international cultural relations. So in a way, cultural diplomacy is mainly and a little bit in a way as well, international cultural relations depend of uh, governmental driven uh, forces. But I think it's important to separate the analysis of geostrategic movements from the analysis of how in the different world societies there are raising for one side populist movements which are very clear against the liberal understanding of uh, the, the, the human rights and, the, and in the case of culture about the cultural rights 
And, uh, and we see that not just outside Europe, we see that in Europe as well. Um, and all these populist movements uh, <clears throat> has a very specific, quite nationalist, nationalist approach of cultural policies. For instance, in Europe, the Hungarian government is the ones who increase the most their cultural budget. So that means that for them, it's a quite useful policy for pushing their, their own ideological side. So when we try to analyze that from an uh, international cultural relations point of view, first of all, we need to understand that do we want to be instrumentalized by uh, these uh, populist movements, these nationalist movements? Are we enough strong from the bottom up point of view to develop a more uh, equity, a more balanced kind of relationship? Or is it impossible to talk about this kind of balance because um, uh, there are countries and societies and identities that had benefits historically and uh, until now uh, of quite big budgets and capacity to impose their own way of understanding the world, to impose their own identities and cultures to the more weaker part of, of, of the world. So I think we need to analyze that from all these points of view <clears throat> and to see if it's possible to have a non-aligned social movement, which is a totally different than a political movement. So, and in this case, what are our allies? What are the kind of uh, uh, partners, both at governmental level and non-governmental level, that could be our allies to build a more fairer, a more balanced kind of relations. So I don't think that the issue about the, the war and NATO and so on, which is a very strategic and military kind of approach, could help that. But I think we need to find allies also in these countries, in Russia, in the United States, in China. Of course, we know that in some of these countries it will be much more difficult to find these allies because they are with a very strong pressure in authoritarian regimes. But in any case, if we really want to build a more bottom-up kind of international cultural region. And this is the reason why I do prefer to talk about international cultural relations and not about cultural diplomacy because cultural diplomacy by its nature is going to be driven. Mm -hmm. Then the second question really uh, 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 is connected to wh what you said, and that is the question of the strategy uh, uh, of the best way to form these alliances and internationally uh, connect dispersive local artistic and activistic actions. So what would be the best strategy for that? From my point of view, bottom up again without having any problem to receive money from people who have maybe mm -hmm. some very clear interests and they are trying to instrumentalize us. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what are our red lines, but at the same time, we have to be intelligent mm -hmm. and use the money if we think it's not totally contradictory about our goals in order to achieve this kind of alliance. So to meet people by people, for instance, it's easier to work with a public museum in this equal situation with a with the public theater that with the governmental level, which is much more political oriented. So why not we try to work with all the levels? So excuse me, with all public and private institutions, but always in this bottom up, trying to find the 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 the, 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 the specific spaces for building a more balanced kind of cooperation. Thank you, Vittoria. About, no, I, t I totally agree. And uh, actually I think that, uh, well, international networks are already doing uh, a, a good work about that. Uh, I, I was I was quoting IETM network, but Culture Action Europe, uh, uh, all the um, uh, networks that 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 in in, in a way um, uh, do uh, 
yeah, do you advocate for the arts uh, from a more bottom-up uh, processes? They are actually the they are voices uh, within uh, the political uh, political discussions, uh, uh, and they 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 try. Uh, they have been trying for years uh, to to bring voices uh, from uh, all the countries that are part of the networks uh, in a more horizontal way at the uh, at the at the international institutions also to push the decisions for how to shape fundings and programs uh, uh, so top down fundings and programs also to embed questions and uh, desires and uh, and uh, critiques from from below uh, so uh, of course is uh, it's uh, always an ongoing process so we um, we still have to to do a lot of advocacy as cultural professionals but I think that uh, a lot of networks uh, has done a lot and also international projects uh, uh, that uh, has uh, uh, that has as a focus uh, uh, the uh, the impacts on local uh, on a local level that can actually shape uh, policy scenarios and um, and uh, yeah. how do you see the red lines that Professor Bonnet mentioned that shouldn't be crossed? What are what are these? Um, <laughs> what what is something that we shouldn't do while organizing all these projects and activities, and while being being financed by corporations? At the end, what is that that shouldn't be crossed? It's 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 a difficult <laughs> question. Uh, but I mean, it's not only for the arts. Uh, I mean, it's uh, for. Uh, every kind of sector so that you have to be very uh, very clear about your ethical position um, I don't know I would love to have to have an answer a specific answer to this question but uh, um, I mean um, I think that that you you have if you if you have political issues to to uh, you have to choose properly your uh, the the people and uh, and the institution you want to dialogue with. But at the same times, you can't uh, marginalize yourself uh, in in a corner be- to 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 preserve your uh, sort of uh, purity of action. You have to bring the your ethical issues in your daily practices. And struggle for them. Uh, I mean, the 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 um, all of us is not is not uh, is uh, is exposed to errors. Every one of us is exposed to to mistakes. But uh, you have to be conscious of your uh, of your visions, and uh, you have to be conscious uh, also to to. I mean, you have to put an effort to not make the same mistakes uh, uh, in. Um, in you uh, w- w- developing developing your your work um holy uh, holy said i think that depends on the strength uh, of channels of independence for an organization sure. right doesn't have to be pure to hold space holy if you want to engage in discussion please do so you also had some questions um for this did week. but um the last one i can follow up with you about um but i was curious about cultural capacity building because it feels like a lot of what we talk about on you know in conferences and uh from thinking about bottom up is is capacity building um and i think it kind of does go with uh the role of curator and how much like goes between different levels uh, is is part of conversation and bottom up certainly um you know, not bypasses, but sort of bypasses gatekeeping and things, but then how do you move that to other levels? How do you move that up levels across borders uh, and make it, you know, have impact beyond the community of artists or, um, you know, kind of seep into 
uh, seep the impact of coordination into better images of, of other places, other cultures. Okay. Uh, I, I just, uh, I had something popped in my mind because of Paula's um, presentation. Maybe there will, can be a savior with money uh, I wanted to ask her uh, what, uh, of her opinion uh, on Banksy's work uh, in Borders. Ah, can you repeat? I, I couldn't hear it. Uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to ask of your opinion of uh, Banksy's work on, on, the, on the Borders. The artist Banksy, I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, uh, yeah, like the. Well, for example, in the Israeli uh, Palestine border, he built uh, a, a very big uh, hotel, like post colonial UK hotel, and he was selling uh, art artworks to tourists who were coming and the, the, who could see the, the war in life. So it is really um, interesting and intriguing uh, artistic practice. We don't know who he is. We don't know how many, uh, how much money does he have. Uh, he's very, very popular and rich and present in all these um, most important um, territories, Mexico, uh, Israel, with his uh, artistic activity by raising awareness of the problem. Yeah, I'm not quite sure if you're talking about uh, this like art piece that was uh, placed in the in the fence. Yeah, uh, maybe I can find a link. Yeah, where people could like gather together and play. Yes. yes. Yeah, well, actually, I think like the the border in general and in particular that fence that it's in Tijuana and San Diego, there's been quite many artistic um, yeah, artistic pieces uh, exhibiting there, and there's been quite many installations. But also, there's like the whole uh, borderland area. It's it's full of of cultural activities and uh, and exchanges, like some festivals or even like celebrations where they share like. Um, yeah, that they share space like in, in San Diego and, and Tijuana. So it's, yeah, it's quite a lively place. And I think that this also um, encourages a, a view of the border, like a different view of the border that we normally see in the, in the media, for example, which is quite violent and harsh. Um, I guess so what do you think in investing in uh, artworks on the border or some other forms of supporting the, the, the endangered community by a very rich artist? Well, I guess it. I mean, it. It's 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 fine. It would be. It, it's nice because they they have the the chance to like as you said spread the word about the raise awareness about yeah about, about the conditions of of the border and what's going on there of course there's as as also what Vittoria was uh, uh, pointed out it it's also about how your values and as an organization or as an artist uh, which are your values and which kind of like resources or funders will you accept? For example, in the case of Fandango Fronterizo, there was this particular situation when 
uh, because Fandango Fronterizo is not funded by the state and it's mostly funded like they sell their own products and they have also some funding from non-profit organizations and it's also mostly uh, funded by like volunteer work so um yeah they had this situation when that so there was a like a brand who wanted to support uh, with some money uh the event but uh the board of the like the collective who is organizing it decided not to get mm -hmm. that uh that money because it was against these traditional values and mm -hmm. and ideologies of of like it was more like a commercial brand so it went against their values so refusing certain funding can be uh, this red line <laughs> that we mentioned yeah yeah it's of course an, an, an option and and at the same time i would say that they are dealing with uh, as well with these issues of funding because anyways they are inserted in like in a marketized system mm -hmm. so so if it if it was just like the tradition in a in a small town in mexico it works it can work as as it was originally created or or developed but because this tradition ha has been taken to a different context which is the border and there's also other like there's a system around it like a capitalist system then they also have to struggle with that and deal with those with those situations so it's kind of trying to find the balance where they they can get like this uh like, where they have this uh like volunteer work uh, which is like very traditional based but also like dealing with with these other realities so Thank you very much. Uh, I think that our time is up. If there is somebody who uh, who has an urgent need to give a comment, a question, or to share something, now now's the time for that. Um, uh, thank you very very much. Uh, uh, I hope we will. Th this is recorded, so. Uh, other people will will be able to to hear very interesting presentations that we heard today. Uh, so please enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.